We were sent a video by a young man said he, he saw this on TikTok and said, Dr. Brown, it would be great if you could put out a video rebutting this because a lot of people are watching it and thinking it's true. So let's take a look at this video. Let's look at what it has to say. And let's ask, is it true or false, fact or fiction? Here we go. Oh my God, I literally want nothing more than for this to be a valid argument, but I'm going to tell you why it's not a valid argument. As a former clergy member, somebody who used to work in the Methodist church, who has a master of divinity, um, I know biblical Hebrew and Koine Greek. I've translated multiple books of the Bible. Um, it's not a valid argument because the word homosexuality is literally does not exist in the original text. Nope. In the 1940s, the word homosexuality was invented by biblical scholars translating the RSV translation in order to propagate homophobia. So it's listed nowhere in scripture, nor does Jesus ever talk about it. And before anybody's like, oh, well, in Leviticus, it talks about man shall not lie with man. Well, first and foremost, an American publishing company did that. That's not in the original text either. Because if you look at the Martin Luther Bible, the German word that it's used is knaben, which means boy. Talking about pedophilia. So take several seats. Ah, is this true? Uh, actually, as we'll see in a minute, every word is fictitious. Every word is false. I can't say about her own background, etc., but every claim she makes is absolutely false. Let's go through them one at a time. Hey, do you love truth? Let's follow the truth wherever it leads. So she first said the word homosexuality, homosexual, was invented by Bible translators in the 1940s. Is that true? Well, anyone knows the origin of the word knows that is Flatly not true. Here, let's just go, for example, to the stanford.edu website. And it says this under the subject of homosexuality. The term homosexuality was coined in the late 19th century. Ah, the late 1800s by an Austrian-born Hungarian psychologist, Carly Maria Benker. Although the term is new, discussions about sexuality in general and same-sex attraction in particular have occasioned philosophical discussion ranging from Plato's Symposium to contemporary queer theory. So, is it true that the term homosexuality was invented by Bible translators in the 1940s? No, absolutely false. Now, what happened was the term was not used in Bible translations before that because the term did not exist, but the concept existed and that's the concept that is being discussed in the Bible. The Bible presupposes heterosexual relations. God made men for women, women for men. He created us male and female. That's why the Bible talks about husbands loving wives and wives honoring husbands. That's why the Bible talks about children obey your father and mother because heterosexuality is presupposed. And throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, all same sex relationships, sexual relationships, are flatly condemned in Scripture. Okay, what about Leviticus 18.22? She raises that verse and says it's American translators that came up with the idea of um, sin from man to lie with a man. Is that accurate? Well, let's take a look. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. I'll read the Hebrew really slowly. If you know Hebrew, it reads from right to left. Ve'et zachar, and with a male... Lo tishkav, you shall not lie. Speaking to a male, the et zachar, and with a male, lo tishkav, you shall not lie, mishkave isha, the lyings of a woman. In other words, the way you have sex with a woman, the way you penetrate a woman, the way you are physically with a woman in a sexual relationship, you do not do that with a male. You do not penetrate another male. You do not have sexual relations with another male. Toevahi. It is an abomination. It is detestable. Now, here's the deal. Anyone who can read Hebrew on any level, even a first year Hebrew student, a child growing up reading Hebrew, let alone a biblical scholar, someone who knows biblical Hebrew, knows that the word boy, youth, does not occur there. It's not found. Not found, not hinted at, zero. It is not there. You say, well, but what about Martin Luther? Why did he say Gnabin? Why did he talk about boys? Well, he got it wrong. There are many areas in Luther's translation. Isn't the whole thing to go back to what the original says? Here, let me illustrate how wrong Luther was. The Queen James Bible was a Bible put out by gay activists to try to soften the blow of what the Bible said about homosexual practice. So here's how they translate Leviticus 18.22. 
Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind in the temple of Molech is an abomination. Well, the one problem is the Bible doesn't mention the temple of Molech. Those words are added in. Doesn't it say at the end of the book of Revelation that it is a sin to add words to the Bible? Why didn't they put in boy? Because boy is not there. Here, let's look at some modern German translations. Let's look at the, the Schlachter version, for example. And, and what does it say? Du sollst bei keinem Mann liegen, wie man bei einer Frau liegt. So you will not lie with any man the way you, the way you lie with a woman. Why doesn't it say children? Because children is not there. Okay, let's look at the HOF German translation. Ein Mann darf nicht mit einem anderen Mann schlafen. A man may not lie with another man. Why doesn't it mention children? Because children is not there in the text. The text has nothing to do with pedophilia. It does not mention that. Well, how about the ancient translations? Translations that go back 2,000 years, translations of the original Hebrew. What did they say? Let's look at the Aramaic Targum. It says this, And you have the exact same thing as the Hebrew. And with a male, you shall not lie, the lyings of a woman. How about the Septuagint version, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, which, which goes back even before the time of Jesus, what, what does it say? Kaimeta arsenas. And with a male, you shall not lie, the lines of a woman. There it is again. And with a male, the exact same words. Why? Because that's what the Hebrew says. Anyone on the planet who can read the Hebrew knows that's the case. There's no mystery. This is why you have hundreds, thousands of translations that all read the same way. What about the ancient Syriac? What does the Syriac say? The, the exact same words, again, going from right to left. What's, what's the second word there? Dichra. And with a male, you shall not lie. The lines of a female, the exact same thing. Okay, here, let's look at another ancient translation, the Vulgate. The Vulgate, which is the Latin translation. What does the Vulgate say? Cum masculo. With a man, you will not lie the lines of a woman. It's an abomination. <clears throat> so, is it true that Leviticus 18.22, which prohibits a man from having sex with another man. Is it true that it is actually referring to pedophilia? Uh, no. Completely false. Totally untrue. What about the idea that Jesus said nothing about same-sex relations, same-sex practice? Well, he didn't need to. He's a first century rabbi. We know that first century Jewish teaching very strongly prohibited homosexual practice and, and even said it's basically unheard of in Jewish circles. I mean, that's how wrong it was considered. But, but did Jesus address it? Well, let me show you three ways that he did. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, do not think I came to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So what does Jesus do with the moral and sexual commandments of the Torah, adultery, adultery, divorce, he takes them to a higher level. If it was detestable for a man to sleep with a man under the Torah, it's even more detestable under the teaching of Jesus. Then look at what Matthew writes, Matthew, the 15th chapter, Jesus speaking. And he says this, he says, what you eat doesn't defile you. It's what comes out of your heart. And he says, for out of the heart, verse 19, Matthew 15, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality. That word sexual immorality in the Greek is porneia, and it's there in the plural, meaning all sexual acts outside of wedlock. So Jesus says all sexual acts outside of wedlock defile us. And then finally, Matthew, the 19th chapter, when Jesus is asked about divorce, Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, he says that God's intent for marriage is a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. God made the male and female. The two become one flesh. So Jesus tells us marriage is the lifelong union of one man and one woman. He tells us all sexual acts outside of marriage defile. And then he tells us that he takes the standards of the Torah and the prophets, the moral standards, to an even higher level. That is how he fulfills those. So is it true that Jesus said nothing about homosexual practice. Uh, Not true. Three strikes, you are out. Hey, let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 9, in the Greek, Paul is talking about people who are forbidden from 
entering the kingdom of heaven without repentance and change. And he goes through a list, says, don't be deceived, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And he lists different people. And he talks about the sexually immoral adulterers. And then he says, ute malakoi, ute arsenakoitai. So neither malakoi nor arsenakoitai. What exactly does that mean? Greek scholars have recognized for some time, including gay and lesbian Greek scholars, that this refers to men having sex with men and talks about two different aspects of that relationship of men having sex with men. In fact, one of the leading lesbian feminist scholars who's addressed issues of what the Bible says about homosexuality, Bernadette Bruton, look at what she says in her book, Love Between Women, uh, Early Christian Responses to Female Homoeroticism. That's the title of the book. She said, I see Paul as condemning all forms of homoeroticism. So Paul, this is a, a lesbian feminist scholar in her book, Love Between Women, Early Christian Responses to Female Homoeroticism. She said, I see Paul as contemning all forms of homoeroticism. So any form of a man or a woman in a same-sex relationship, she said she sees Paul as condemning that in his writings. Ah, but here's the good news. Paul didn't stop there. He gave a list of, of all different types of sinners and said, that's what some of you used to be. Some of us came from every kind of background and to the core of our human nature, we're sinful. You see, outside of Jesus, we're all broken. Outside of Jesus, we're all fallen. And, and, and your fallenness, your brokenness may express itself in one way. It may express itself in, in cutting yourself in pain. It may express yourself in, in being violent. It may express yourself in being promiscuous and sleeping around a lot. It may express itself in same-sex attraction. It may express itself in a hundred different ways, a thousand different ways. We've all fallen. We've all fallen short. None of us in ourselves are good enough to enter the kingdom. The good news is that God sent his son Jesus to die in our place. Jesus takes our place. He takes all of our sin. He was perfect. That's why he dies, because he took our sin on his shoulders. He died in our place. He took our penalty. And when we ask God to forgive us, when we accept that gift from God and say, Lord, wash me clean. I did when I was 16, shooting heroin and getting drunk and living a crazy life, playing drums in a rock band full of rebellion. When I asked him to wash me clean, all the guilt disappeared. God changed me from the inside out, and I've been free Ever since then, 1971. So I want to encourage you, whoever you are, whatever your background, don't believe the lies, don't believe the myths, don't believe the fiction, go with the truth. Jesus said the truth would set you free. Homosexual practice, male, female, is always sinful in God's sight, but Jesus died for our sins and offers us a new and better way of life through the cross. Hey friends, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, Click on one of the boxes on the screen, check out another one of our videos and be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss a single video. You know, we discovered that about 60% of you that are watching our videos aren't subscribers. So subscribe today doesn't cost you a dime. And if you want to support our work, Line of Fire and all the things that we do, follow one of the links on the screen below.